Welcome, and uh, this morning it's a bit easier. I asked Maritza last week to that we shift the chairs a little bit, that we can look from Jimmy to Bernard. It's a little bit easier than preaching from there to there. So uh, a warm welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. For a moment this morning, I thought the rapture has happened because I was looking at the worship team and I saw Raylene and I closed my eyes and I worship and I opened my eyes again and gone was Raylene. <laughs> I thought, Lord, what's happening here? But Raylene is on the, in the worship team and on, in the sound desk or behind the sound desk this morning. So no rapture yet. Never mind your view on that. So uh, in Namibia, we've got a public holiday on Tuesday. It's Independence Day, and uh, this is an Independence Weekend. I think many, um, well, most of the schools and maybe some companies, and you know, um, have a long weekend. And I was just thinking about it and pondering on that. And as Namibians, I know, you know, we all will, the young ones will study at school, but we know the history, you know, there's, Namibia became, or the old South West Africa became independent from South, from, the, yeah, from South Africa, and therefore we've got Independence Weekend, and there's always speeches, and nothing wrong with that. I'm not against anything regarding that or celebrating it. But, you know, I was just thinking about being truly free. You know, often, you know, nations over the years, over the centuries, battle each other, and there's wars, and then... You know, one nation rule over another nation or group of people rule over another group of people. And but now, 33 years ago, we said, you know, we are free and we are independent. But, you know, when we look at Scripture, I just want to briefly touch at that. I believe it's important that we always, you know, I've got, uh, you will probably know when, my, when we got here almost eight years ago, my sons were seven years old and now they are 15. And I think like, what has happened? They, we all, well, they grow up so fast, and uh, we need to educate them, and we need to tell them there's, the, there's history, and there's democracy, and there's Independence Weekend, and all these things. But what does the Word of God teach us? And I'm just going to briefly read you um, from John chapter 14, verse 30, because it's just something I'm teaching them. Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. Another well-known well well portion of scripture in 1 John, which is the same author, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So yes, we can celebrate Independence Weekend and do it, nothing wrong. I'm not going to get into politics uh, or anything like that. This is not the place for it. But Jesus said the whole world is still under the sway of the wicked one. So can we say we are truly free? You know, if we go from the Kunene region to the south and the east and the west, and we celebrate, we can say we are free or we are independent. But true freedom only comes through Jesus Christ. Ah, Jesus Christ. In a, in a, now I've lost my mark, but basically in a, John chapter 8, verse 36 you know, it's only when the sun sets us free that we are free indeed. There's no other freedom, okay? So on a, on a let's call it a governmental, and a, a oh, Maritza is showing the kids must go to Kitty's church. My wife is waving at me. So all the, the young ones, if there's any young ones, I think the families, I know all the schools have got a, a long weekend, so Namibians are probably camping or visiting family. Nothing wrong with that as well, but those of you, who still qualify for children's church. There's some of you, you may leave, you may go. But it's only the sun that truly sets us free. No nation, no government, no king can really make us free. It's only through the good news. It's only through being born again and the cross. Well, I apologize. And that's something that we will celebrate as we um, get closer to Easter. So, this morning, I'm going to share this during the past week, um, or no, weeks, me and my wife has established a new culture in our home, and well, it's probably two new cultures, it's not a New Year's resolution, it's something just we just feel, felt we convicted to do, and one of them is we've got a children's church in our house, or we've got church in our house where we just spend time um, with, our, with our children, because 
we, be don't, we believe it's not the, the primary role of the school or even the church to educate our kids and teach them about the Word of God. Yes, the church has got a place, and there the kids go, and we will teach them about the Word of God. But it's our place as parents, as a father and a mother, to sit with our children and to learn them and to teach them to obey the Word and to understand the Word and that they will love the Word. And uh, it's beautiful to see, um, I don't want to force them to be Christians, that, that you cannot do that. You know, they need to respond in their own time, in their own season. But it's beautiful to see um, how they are just taking small steps. Um, sometimes when I don't, there's not a rule in our house that our kids at a certain time have to read scripture now. But just to see as they are starting to grow older, how they draw the word closer and start to read it from them um, for themselves. And, and often I ask them, what have you read? And then they... They tell me a little bit, and I'm like, yeah, you, you see now 30% of the story, awesome. Receive it, love it, and in time as you, as you grow older and you mature, you will love even more of it. The other culture is the, something where me and my wife just take time in the morning, and we read the Word and a book or two together, and just we just reflect on that, and we allow the Word to, to speak to us. And during the past week, I read a scripture, and it just immediately spoke to my heart, I want to share it to you. It's from Jeremiah 6, verse 14. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It will be up there. It, it says, they have, healed, they have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And in the New King James Version, it says, they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So before I continue... You know, I love the people in our church. Lionel, Letitia, thank you for this. It means a lot to me. There's a pin in it as well. If you really want to understand the meaning of this very prophetic gesture, you can ask me afterwards. But thank you for loving me as well. That's good. We need it as pastors as well. So uh, that's just on a light note on the side. Back to Jeremiah, about six centuries before Christ. He's writing and he says, They have healed the wound of my people lightly or slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Now probably, uh, let's be honest this morning, um, every morning, any morning, every day of course, you know, sometimes there's a, there's a vibe in the house. And then there's guests invited to come, and, to come and visit. Or maybe you have been the guest going to someone else. And people greet you at the door. Welcome. And you receive a hug. But you see Wachter, the, the dog, is, is, is laying there somewhere with his paws over his eyes. After a while you see, but listen, there's something you can cut with a knife here. There's something of a bit of a vibe. Maybe there was a family fight. Maybe some of the kids misbehaved. Maybe dad misbehaved. Maybe mom misbehaved. And, you know, we can sense that there's something in the air. Have you ever experienced something like that? Some of you have. Okay, wonderful. I've been on both sides of that where I visited people and I thought like, man, something's wrong here. You, you now you can pick it up. Or people coming over and you get these fake smiles. Um, you know, almost uh, saying as if everything is okay when it's not. And this has got a little bit to do with the context which Jeremiah is writing from. In the late 6th century before Christ, the prophet Jeremiah condemned the leaders of God's people for tolerating a false peace and security. They dressed the wounds of my people as they were not serious. The prophet lamented, peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. And then the author continues and he says, I imagine these ancient leaders were much like we are. Now, often when I read scripture, you know, I think by myself, not a lot have changed. You know, when I read Paul's letters, whether it's to the Corinthians or the Galatians or some of the stuff happening in the Old Testament, I think, well, that's why I probably don't believe in evolution. One of the, the reasons is we didn't change. We don't evolve, okay? 
Um, <laughs> stuff, thank you for that, Ed. Um, stuff, people remain human. We are all born. We all battle the same type of battles throughout our lives. And we need to continuously work on those things. And here it says, I imagine these ancient leaders were much like we are. They avoided and even denied the existence of problems and conflict because they didn't want to rock the boat. Sometimes when we walk into that friend's, parent's, whoever's house, and we see, but there's a false peace. People aren't real. You get these fake smiles, but it's, there's a vibe. You can pick it up. We are sensitive, and some of us are a lot more sensitive um, um, towards things like this. I think body language um, says a lot, and I've seen over the years my wife is a lot more sensitive um, to, to circumstance, these type of circumstances than myself. Okay, I don't know if the women are blessed with more um, a sense of picking it up, but sometimes my wife would say to me, ah, does it's not lacking. And then after a while I can see, well, yeah, she was right there. Something isn't lacking there. Thousands of years later, not much has changed in this regard. Too much of contemporary church culture is char characterized by a false niceness and superficiality. We view conflict as a sign that something is wrong, so we do, we do whatever we can to avoid it. We prefer to ignore difficult issues and settle for false peace, hoping our difficulties will somehow disappear on their own. And they don't. So whether it's in my life, in my marriage, my relationship with my children, my relationship with my, with my father and my stepmom, my relationship with my parents-in-law, or with any else, a neighbor, a person in church, sometimes we feel like, I wish this thing just, just want to go away, okay? Instead of, of dealing with it. Now, some of us are by nature, I think the way God created us, a little bit more open and confrontational than others. Some of us avoid conflict at every cost. If you are here this morning, may, some of us, for, for reasons maybe, uh, we avoid conflict at every cost. And even when the Lord knocks on the, at the door of our heart, sometimes we're like, Lord, I'm going to keep this door closed for a while longer because I cannot go to this place. It's too painful. You know, um, if you have done counseling and walk with people, a lot of the pain and the issues that adults have come from where? Childhood. Comes from childhood. What happened in our childhood? So this morning, I'm going to ask you to only apply most of, of what I'm preaching to yourself. Don't think at your father or your mother or your five brothers and two sisters or your spouse or your kids or parents-in-law or anyone like that. That's just because I've just, I've just been on a journey the past while, you know, to really, really um, say, not that one, not that one, not, not that one, but Lord, work in my heart. Work in my life. The peace expressed by the false prophets was an absence of war and calamity. So, as with our nation in Namibia, often at Independence Day we will hear there's peace and stability and there's an absence of war and an absence of calamities. And we can be thankful for those things. We can celebrate those things. But it doesn't mean everything is okay in every community, in every household, in every nation. When we travel the country, or as I usually say, when we open up newspapers on a Monday morning from the medical care and the health system and social issues, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of hurt, which governments and policies, and I'm not fighting governments or policies or anything this morning. I never want to. But I know that, that the, only, the only hope is in Jesus Christ regarding that. And in this context, the original context, the peace expressed by the false prophets was an absence of war and calamity, a concept far removed from the Old Testament shalom, which emphasizes a wholeness or a soundness. Okay, So sometimes when there's not a major disaster or a financial issue, we can say things are well. But the question is, is it really well with our souls? Is it really well with our relationships, our marriages, 
our relationships with one another, with other parts of the body of the Christ, our neighbors down the street, etc. God wants wholeness and soundness in our lives, not a superficial, I am just fine. Now, those of you who have been in church for five or seven years, you will know Derek and uh, Beric, <laughs> I always get that thing wrong, Derek and Beryl Puffett from LL Ministries. They will come and visit us in the end of October again. Now, I learned something from them. They do a lot of healing, speak to a lot of ministry, especially towards pastors um, and their spouses. And they say when someone, you know, usually come to them and they ask them, how are you? And they, and they say, we are fine. You know, it means they are fragile, insecure, negative, and most likely emotionally hurt, you know. But it's a way of saying, I am fine, you know. Don't get in here. It's messy. It's painful. There's, there's stuff that we have to deal with. So next time, before you tell someone, I am fine, Fine stands for, in the context abbreviated, fragile, insecure, negative, and most likely emotionally hurt, unstable, whatever the case might be. True peace invo involves complete fellowship with God and right relationship with one another. And I think it's something the whole world, the whole of humanity longs for. That peace, that rest, that inner place, um, that place deep, deep in your heart, in your soul, knowing there's a right standing with our Lord Jesus Christ, but also with your neighbor. You know, um, I can tell you many stories, um, and my wife wouldn't mind because we all, it's a journey being married. We know each other for 18 years, um, and uh, I remember the one story, and, and today, as we grew over the years to maturity, I can laugh at these things. We laugh at them. I remember many, many, many years ago, uh, we once, I don't, can't even remember why, but we were driving in Namibia. Now, you know, driving in Namibia is long, rechheid paaie, long, straight roads. And we had a disagreement or a fight about something. And uh, I remember my wife, now I was sitting here, so she's sitting on my left-hand side, and she was staring out of that window the, for a long while. And it was very quiet in the car. You know? You have experienced those type of things? Yes, yes. Thank you for being honest. Okay. And eventually we sort it out and we kiss and make up in that sense. And she joked and it said, I can't even Afrikaans. And she said, Weet jy, my neck was later so seer van net hierdie kant toe kyk. You know, my neck was actually hurting because I didn't want to look at you. I was just staring out of the window. But you know, after a few hours, you know, just looking like that, and we can only laugh at ourselves. We can only laugh at the foolish, childish, immature things we sometimes um, fight over, battle each other over, and it's really not worth it. But there's also lessons to be learned. There's a journey in that where we need to, to grow. Um, I've, quite, I've said it before, uh, just between us, it's not something you'll find in the Word. We just... Uh, uh, adopted the thing where we said we don't want the scoreboard to say one for the enemy and zero for us. Come on. Okay? Let's look it. Eh? Repent. Whatever. Okay? That the scoreboard can say zero for the enemy and one for us. And that's what the Lord wants us. Complete, healthy, close fellowship with Him and right relationships with one another. And I've learned, and I've got it wrong so often in different areas of my life, um, that sometimes there's this elephant in the room, and we ignore it, and we ignore it, and we hope that it will go away. Okay, just the, if there's any dentists here, please do not take offense. Who of you are afraid of going to the dentist? Some of us are, okay? Some of us are. That's okay. Some of us are maybe scared to go to a dentist because we're a little bit sensitive what happens here in the mouth you know now i've heard many stories that you've been walking with that pain walking with that pain hoping that it will go away and sometimes it might but usually there's pain because there's a hurt there's a there's a wound there's there's something inflammation or, or something wrong 
Um, and it applies to the whole of our bodies. And we hope that it will go away. Once again, um, you know, I've got three children, and they, they, they differ really a lot. The one, I would say, av speaks an average amount of words in a day. The one definitely says the words very sparingly. And the other one, man, he speaks a lot. Okay, I, I'm not sure where that come from. Where's my wife? But uh, we had this, this joke in our car, you know, when we drive to Vinduk. I said to the one, blue chips, blow chips. That was a code word between me and him. Please keep quiet. Okay, at Isakos or somewhere. Okay, man, you've, 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 I, I cannot... I cannot cope with that much speaking and answering in one day. But it's all in a good sense. It's all in a good, in a good, with, in a good part or whatever we want to say. But you know, the point is, sometimes, for some of us, it's easier to say, you have stepped on my toe, you have done something, I'm a little bit hurt. Some of us just hope that it will go away, you know, like the... There was that old ad many years ago about, um, what's that chocolate? Flake. Was it flake? Flake. All resistance crumble. Thank you, Anna Lure. You know, that, 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 that type of thing, the discipline, it will just go away. But if there's something that we need to deal with, we need to deal with it. Now, this was Israel's response to Jeremiah's warning. They kept listening to the predictions of peace because they did not like Jeremiah's condemnation of their sin. They, they actually rather wanted to listen to these guys that said, there's no war, there's no calamities, therefore everything is okay. Compared to a Jeremiah that said, listen, this is what the Lord say, you better listen. Okay? Denying the truth never changes it. What God says will always happen. Sin is never removed by de denying its existence. Okay? In the context of what Jeremiah was actually speaking about and preaching about and warning the people about. So I can only ask us this, the question, starting with me, myself this morning and say, is there anything that I need to deal with in my life at this stage? Is there anything that I wish it will just go away? Or is there stuff with my wife, with my kids, siblings, wherever that I need to say, but there's something, maybe it's five or ten years ago, you know, that I, need to, that I need to work out. And I've seen in our bigger family, I've seen big, beautiful testimonies. Even after a decade of people, we're not a perfect family, you know, of not speaking to each other, in, in my bigger family context, where people or a person went to the other one and say, hey, let's put it behind us. Let's sort this thing out. And then the Lord brings restoration. And then there's a testimony. And then we can testify about it. And it's, and it's beautiful. So I need to ask the question for me and for us. Maybe you need to ask it in the context of, of your married life, relationship with children. Maybe you're in your 60s or 70s and children are in the 40s. Maybe you are in your 40s and your children are in their teens. I don't know. Maybe you've got an older parent that there's something that... There's this false peace. There's not a war. But you know, something's not right. Do we want to deal with those things? How do we deal with that? And coming back to, to the word, a scripture that I've quoted so often, and I think every pastor has got its own 500 favorite verses. Now we all have them, and it might be different for, for one because of who he is or gifting and, and whatever. But one that has always blessed me and challenged me is Hebrews 4 verse 12. It says, the word of, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There's no way around the word of God. We can justify, we can fight, and I've done it many times in my life, where I thought, but it's Maritza's fault, or it's my child's fault, or it's my dad's fault, or my mom, or a grandparent, or whoever. It's the church's fault. It's this one's fault. Okay? But the word of God will cut our own hearts. It's like a mirror 
How often do we read something in the Word and we think, but hey, it's alive. It speaks to me. It cuts my heart. And God intended it to be like that. And you know, I've said it a few times last year. Um, if you knew, I had a two and a half month sabbatical. I'm so thankful for that. But I took my, some of my resources and I read, I read about church history. Church history. 1,500 years ago and the early church and Constantine. And we can, we can go into all of that. And you know what? We just see some of the same patterns repeating themselves, repeating themselves over and over again. Every generation needs to get healing and salvation, of course, in, in their own lives, in their own marriages, etc. The word will cut. And you know, just looking at that, we can, I'm asking this morning, and it's, it's just um, something I'm asking and thinking about in the bigger picture. We've got the Roman Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox Church. We've got the Protestants and the Charismatics and the Anglicans and the Lutherans. And everyone thinks their interpretation of the word is correct. And the other ones miss something. So when I look at Hebrews 4 verse 12 and the word cutting, I'm just amazed that, that we've got one word and it can be interpreted by different denominations, churches, in such a different way. It's interesting. So who's really right and who's really wrong? Well, we're not going to solve this, that one, this side of, the, of eternity, I believe. <laughs> I like the people saying no because I think it's, it's not going to happen. But I believe that you are, when you are truly born again and you are filled with the Spirit, the Word of God will minister to your life. Even if there's a 10 or a 20 or a 50% blind spot, stuff that you miss or you don't read or you've got a different view from someone else, the Word will still cut our hearts. And once again, when I turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I almost see like a, a plumb line. The Lord advising us about how to, how to live. When was it? I did on Friday morning, on short notice, we, we helped a couple. Um, the children are in one of our shofar churches in South Africa, and we, the father, uh, Andre Besaidno, he passed away, and we, I did just a small portion of the, of the um, gedenkdienst. But you know, now why did I say that? I can't remember now, but I'll get back to that. Um, oh, yeah, no, sorry, that thought this just disappeared. It does happen sometimes. I wanted to say something about what I said on Friday morning, and now I can't remember, but uh, please forgive me for that. Um, let's get back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16 to 21. I want to read it to you. It says, from now on, therefore, re we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone... Now, I'm not one of those pastors who tell the church, say after me, because I think there's a place for manipulation. But if you want to, say after me, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We need to celebrate that. We need to celebrate that. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And that is why we can celebrate regarding Easter and, and the message on that. And when we can, we can celebrate this morning, if we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You are a new creation. I am a new creation. That the old has passed. That we can treat each other. That's why we are brothers and sisters. We've got the same father that saved us. The old has passed. That's why the gospel is such a new, good news. Whether you came to Christ at 20 or 40 or 60 years of age. We can celebrate and we can say, but those old things, 
That old man has died. It passed away. It's the new one living right now. And we need to see each other through that lens. Because that's how God looks at us. Yes, we are still on a road of sanctification. There's stuff that we still do get wrong. And, and we are usually quite aware of it, that. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God. It's not the church who, 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 um, who um, has thought it out. It's from God. All of this is from God. Who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God has been reconciling the world to himself. Not counting their trespasses against them. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Can we as a church celebrate that? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The person, my friend, brother, sister behind me, before me, the person in the church down the street in Vinduk, in Ukraine, in Russia, in South Africa, who know Christ, that has entered through that narrow gate, that whose heart has been regenerated, where the heart of stone has been removed, and God has given us a heart of flesh. That person is a new creation. Okay, Can we celebrate that? Can it be a, a core value of saying, that's the first thing that I see when I look at you? Not the way you park your car, or how you sing, or how you lead a small group, or how you this, or how you that. Let's see that firstly. New creation, the old has passed. Jesus Christ has paid a massive price at the cross. He made atonement for us regarding that. Let's speak about being ambassadors. Okay, we, we are, most of us will be familiar with the word, it's a political appointment, and just two definitions, it says, so what does ambassadors do? Two definitions, one says, a person, now just think, think yourself, think church, think believer, think Christian, when I read the definition, a person who represents, speaks for, or advertise a particular organization, Group of people, activity, or brand. Please don't preach shofar. Preach Jesus Christ. This is just the corp, the name of the church. It could be living waters. It could be found on the rock. It could be God's children. The name is just the name, okay? We need to preach Jesus Christ. The second um, one says, someone who represents a particular sport, business, etc. because they have or because they behave in a way that people admire. Now just think about us as that's been called to be representatives, ambassadors for Christ. The ministry of reconciliation have been entrusted to us. Us we who are new in Jesus Christ. Now, in about a month's time, month and a half, we will be eight years in Shafa Swakopmund. Before that, I was for six and a half years in Shafa Vinduk, and before that, another six years in Shafa Stellenbosch. And you know, it's just a good thing where we can, on a personal level, I can just ask myself, as I said, me and my wife, uh, we sit together every morning, read through the word, and we read a book, specific book in a specific time, and we allow it to, to, to minister to us. And I just need to ask myself, how do I do in terms of representing Jesus Christ at family, get-togethers, at the school, when I walk, um, whatever I do, 
How do I represent Jesus Christ? And secondly, I need to ask, I've been in this church now for eight years. How do we represent Jesus Christ? Well, we need to ask the community. We need to ask our neighbors. We need to ask Swakop Munt. What do we see in that group of people called Chofa Swakop Munt in terms of being ambassadors for Christ? Do we represent God accurately? Do we represent Jesus Christ through our words, our actions, our love for one another accurately? I said early on, just apply it to yourself this morning. So I'm speaking to myself. I'm not excluded. In ter- I'm not excluding myself in terms of what I'm saying this morning. How do we rep- do we represent God, His Word, His love, the gospel accurately? Have we grown in the past eight years? Because I was trying to look for it, but I couldn't find it. Because we eight years is a is a long time, and I cannot find that folder where I saved my first sermons. But I know for a fact that one of my, I still know the desk in that house we rented in Medigold Street where I prepared that sermon. One of the first sermons after I moved from Shafa Swakopmund, uh, from Shafa Winduk to Shafa Swakopmund, preparing a sermon. And I spoke about being ambassadors for Christ, ambassadors for Jesus. Okay? And I just need to ask, it's not a question I'm going to try to answer this morning. I just believe it's a question that individually and as a household or a family and as a church, a corporate church, we can ask ourselves in terms of being an ambassador, of of walking around with the name of Jesus Christ on our foreheads or on our, in the the way we, we behave. Have we grown in that? Where do we stand? Sure. Do my small group represent God accurately? Does my marriage represent God accurately? Last night I was thinking, just meditating, about who would I say is the people in church that represents God most accurately? Who's the best ambassador? And I'm looking at you this morning. How does my marriage represent God? Do the way, the way I father my kids, does it represent God accurately? What would the community say about the way we represent God? The word is beautiful. The word is accurate. The word is a two-edged sword. I want to read to you from 1 John 3, verse 10 to 15. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. Helping us, giving us advice how to represent God accurately. By this, and it's the the Apostle John writing, he says, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are clearly identified. There's a clear distinction that he uses here. And he says, anyone who does not practice righteousness, just check, I've got it up there, yes. Anyone who does not practice righteousness, Who does not see God's will in thought, action, and purpose is not of God. So it's not what Carl is saying. It's not what Shofar is saying. It's what the Apostle John, John the Beloved, is saying. So let me just read that sentence again. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are clearly identified. Anyone who does not practice righteousness, who does not see God's will in thought, action, and purpose is not of God. Nor is the one who does not unselfishly love his believing brother. Let the word just cut. I said, let's just apply it to ourselves. This is how John is drawing a distinction between children of the devil and children of God. Verse 11. For this is the message which you believers have heard from the beginning of your relationship with Christ. That we should unselfishly love and seek the best for one another and not be like Cain who was of the evil one and the murderer his, and, and murdered his brother Abel. And why did he murder him? Because Cain's deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Verse 13. 
Do not be surprised, believers, if the world hates you. Okay? Now, when I came to Christ, I experienced such a measure of joy and love and newness. In Jaffa Stellenbosch, that church that I went to, even the small group, I really felt it. But it wasn't very long where this word, the word of God, the truth also started to work where it says the world will hate you. Because some of my old friends started to say, but hey man, why, why don't you want to come to the braai on a Friday evening? And why don't you do, want to do this? And you become now all weird and all of that. And you start to feel that persecution. Remember, I've said it many times in 28, when Maritza and I with the, our, the twins, the boys, which was eight months old at that stage, left Stellenbosch because we prayed it. And Pastor Fred and Lucille at that stage said, Go and pray if you feel you need to go to Shafa Winduk. And we felt we needed to go. It was in our hearts. But man, did we get persecuted for that. Not everyone thought that was of God. But that's okay. So we know the world hates us. We know that we have passed out of death into life. Because we love the brothers and sisters. He who does not love remains in spiritual death. Verse 15. Everyone who hates between that's the amplified helps us sometimes a little bit everyone who hates or works against his brother in christ is at heart a murderer by god's standards and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him the word cuts deep it's its purpose it needs to help us to do the dipstick in our own hearts and lives just want to read you from the New Living Translation. Just puts it a little bit different. One John chapter three verse ten. It says, "So now we can tell that um, we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God." It's a verse that really cuts deep. And I believe the church have, if you read church history, it's not. From my 20 years in ministry of being a believer, I can say it. But if you read church history, Justin Martyr, John Huss, the Old Testament, you can see all the names, all these things, um, these things happening over and over, you know. And I challenge you, especially as we walk towards Easter, you know, people in other churches, pastors in other churches, people in your own small group, People in small groups in other churches. I am really challenged to get to a place of first see their newness in Christ. And that's the most important thing to see. That they are brothers and sisters. Matthew chapter 5 verse 43 to 45. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Okay? It's almost like tithing. In the Old Testament, there was a, there was a law principle to say you need to give 10%. In the New Testament, there's grace where Paul comes and he says you can give over and above. You don't have to just give 10%. You can give more. There's grace that will empower you. That will change your heart to give freely, as Paul says. In the Old Testament it said, you heard it was said. Now this is Jesus speaking. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And he says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's the bar is higher in the New Testament in terms of giving. And I'm not talking about giving this morning. It's just an example. There's empowering grace. For us to give over and above. But there's also empowering grace. A change of heart. A heart of stone removed with a heart of flesh. Where we can say, where Jesus can say, commands us in a sense, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And just, I have to just to take a step back and to say, Lord, I'm still growing in it. Lord, I'm still growing in it. It's not always easy. But that's the standard that Jesus is giving to his church. Because in verse 45 it says, So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just 
and the unjust. So this morning, if I come back and I go back to, to Jeremiah saying, peace, peace, and there's no, and there's no real peace. Yeah? It's an opportunity for all of us to just do, to ask ourselves, is there an elephant in the room? I'm talking about myself now. Is there anything that I need to look at? Is there any false peace in our marriages? Maybe in people that you know. Now, when we walk to people and we point our finger to someone down the street and say, I've heard that you shouted at your wife or at your husband, you should repent. We usually don't win a friend. We don't, usually don't get very far with that attitude. But you know, when we testify and we can say, as I said this morning, my wife laughing because looking for 200 kilometers one way because I don't want to look at my husband because I'm angry. We, we can grow over those, those things and can maybe have a different approach and say, but is there anything how I can love you or serve you or help you with? Because, you know, I think there's so much brokenness. There's so much brokenness, especially in marriages. I'm not thumb sucking it. Um, inside the church, outside the church, divorce, etc., broken relationships, we can just take steps and steps forward and say, Lord, start with me, start with my heart. Because there's a false peace, and the world is organized in a way today, there's so many things that we can be addicted to, alcohol or drugs, and I'm not I'm just using, using general examples, social media or whatever that can give us that, that security. You know, women breastfeed their children. That's the real thing. But we can give them, that little one, sometimes a dummy, something false, that that little baby will just be quiet. Okay. Now, once again, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but it's not the real thing. It's not the real thing. And there's so many things where we can be busy with, busy, 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 social media, sports, and all those things to keep our attention away, to give us a false peace when the wounds and the hurts has just been slightly healed. There's probably not a person in this church who can say, I've got no small little issue even, because we cannot be completely healed and perfect this side of eternity. There will also be, always be something that we can continue to grow in. The enemy has from the start set a trap called religion for us as the church. You know, Jesus' fight were often with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, because they were outwardly doing the right thing. But in, inwardly, in Matthew 23, we read, Jesus says, you are whitewashed tombs, etc. Let's not trap walk, get into that trap or think that just going through the motions will bring true healing to our hearts. We need to be close to that living fountain called Jesus Christ. We need to be very close to it and say, Lord, if there's rocks in this heart, if there's pains or hurts or anything inside of this heart, please heal it, okay? Because we've speak, been speaking in the context of maturity this past few months, growing to, to maturity. I've said now a few times, what should flow from a mature heart? Well, how do we measure it? Look at Jesus Christ. Look at Paul. Look at the men of God as a, as a plumb line of maturity. What is flowing from their hearts? There's, there's times and seasons in church that I've experienced where we, we tell people, you must do this and you must do that. And yes, sometimes we, we get a reaction. But I believe, I do believe that if, that if there's a healthy relationship with Jesus and with one another, there will be living waters flowing, flowing from our hearts. False peace has got a way of deceiving us. It's got a way where we don't deal with the true issues in our lives. And the enemy is, is a master that, that, we, that he used those things 
to keep us back from our full potential, who we should be and what he has called us to do. So this morning, that this is my heart. I believe that the word is powerful. I believe that the word cuts deep. And that as we read it, as we study it, um, that we can grow in being ambassadors for Christ. People accurately representing Jesus. So if you want homework, if you want something to meditate on, just go and study scripture. And I'm not saying you don't, but ask yourself, if you look at a Paul or a Peter or a Jesus, how do I, how do I represent my master, the Lord, my Lord and Savior? As has often been said, being born again isn't just a ticket to heaven. There's a mandate. There's a calling. There's a great commission for all of us to go and to be an ambassador. Let's just, rip, let's just reflect on our own ambassadorship and ask, how do I represent the Lord Jesus Christ? Father, we come to you this morning, Lord God. And yes, Lord God, you know our hearts. You know everything about us, Lord God. And Father, we, Lord, I sometimes want to avoid your word, Lord God, because it's so straight. It cuts so precisely, Lord. It, it shows us some, you know, often, Lord God, where we, where we miss the mark, Lord God. But Lord, you gave us your Holy Spirit. You gave us your Spirit to help us and to guide us, Lord. That when we come to you, Lord God, and we ask for, for guidance and for wisdom, Lord God, for counsel, Lord God. Yes, Lord God, that you will show us. That you will help us. That you will heal us, Lord God. You have placed beautiful people in our midst, in our church, in our community, Lord God. People that can take us by the hand and pray with us. And can put a hand on our shoulder where we can love one another, but also be honest with one another. Lord, at, at this stage, I can only pray and ask, Lord God, that help me to be a, a bad, better ambassador for Christ, Lord God. In my thoughts, in my heart, in my mind, in my actions, the way I use my mouth, Lord God. That it can bring glory to your name, Lord. And Father, I have to repent, Lord, that often, often I, I fall short, Lord God. That we miss it, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you don't just walk away from us. But you stand with arms wide open, Lord. Lord, as we sang last week, that words of the song, Waymaker, it's just been echoing, echoing in my heart the whole week even when we don't see it you are at work lord god you are constantly healing our hearts speaking us loving us giving us dreams giving us scripture placing people in our lives whom we can learn from lord i pray that we can treat everyone that's a new person in christ lord god that we can yeah, that we can not regard people according to the flesh any, anymore. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. That we can see that whole, that new creation for what it is. The word says that we will be slow to judge, Lord God. That we can only look at the planks in our own eyes. And leave the specks in others' eyes, Lord God. That we can be ambassadors of what you have done in our lives. That we can use our voices, our lungs, the breath in our lungs, our minds and our hands to lift them to worship you. Because you deserve it. You're our Abba Father. You're our God, our King, our Savior, our Redeemer. We are the bride, Lord God. Lord, you said you will come back for a for a beautiful bride, Lord. Lord, that we can prepare ourselves. If we don't know how, Lord, that we can just fall flat on our faces. And ask you, Lord, to start with me. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. For your love, Lord God. That we can shout from the rooftops, Lord. Just about your goodness. The miracles you have done in our midst, Lord God. 
O oh Lord, the words that have been prophesied over this church, that we will hold on to them, Lord God, as the days are growing darker, Lord God, as the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. Lord, we don't look at governments to heal our hearts. We look to you, Lord. We look to you that you will set us free. The person next door, the person in my family, a neighbor, a colleague, that we will continue fervently, Lord, to pray for those who don't know you yet, Lord. Give us the compassion, Lord God. A compassion and a, a heart for the harvest to come in in these last days, Lord God. Lord, that we will not look at our neighbor to bring it in, but that I can be an ambassador, Lord. A love-filled ambassador. Not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God at work. We love you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Walk with us, Lord. Protect us, Lord. Those who can't be here this morning, brothers and sisters who's on the roads, Lord, may your hand be over them traveling. And as we go home, Lord, that every house, every family represented here, Lord, that there will be a life-giving fountain of the Word and the Spirit a sweet aroma that we will carry with us. In Jesus' name, Amen.